اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم لاسٹ منتھ آئی اسٹارٹیڈ ود اے حدیث آف پروفٹ صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم وچ از کال حدیث جبریل اور حدیث احسان And as I mentioned that this hadith has been the basis of Islamic knowledge and Islamic learning in the classical period of Islam. So you may find some text, uh, <coughs> including Imam Ibn Taymiyyah's book on Uh, uh, shara of this hadith, explanation of this hadith. Uh, <clears throat> in that hadith, the religion is defined in three aspects. One is the aspect of Islam. And here word Islam is used not as the name of religion, but in terms of activity or human action okay. and here Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defined deen in terms of what a person is supposed to do. Okay. Then in terms of Iman or faith Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam defined what a person is supposed to believe okay. and believe is a mental activity it's inner activity okay. action is the activity of body okay. body acts okay. uh, but belief is something which you absorb you take in belief is not visible Belief is not visible, but act is visible, okay. amal are visible. And in the third aspect, Prophet ﷺ defined religion as inner state of a person. Okay. That there he did not mention either an activity, what you are doing, or your belief, what you understand, but he simply talked about the inner state of a person. So here, nothing is involved in terms of doing, nothing is involved in terms of understanding, but a lot is involved in terms of inner self, and where this inner self is situated vis-a-vis -vis God. Okay. And that is what he called Ihsan. Okay. And he said Ihsan is you worship God as you see him. Al-Ihsan an ta'abudullah ka anna ka tarahu as you see him. And for illam takun tarahu for innahu yarak, if you do not see him, you know he sees you. Okay. So here, in fact, ihsan can have two dimensions. The highest degree of ihsan is where a person is seeing God. Okay. And the lower ihsan is that he knows God is seeing him. Okay. So ihsan has two dimensions. Now, <clears throat> these three things, they are all part of religion. Okay. And, it's, and the most lowest and basic aspect of religion is activity. Okay. Doing what is required. Okay. So when a person becomes Muslim, what does he do? he starts to perform religious obligations or religious acts. Okay. At the higher stage is Iman. 
where a person starts to understand and absorb the elements of belief, what really God is, what is really hereafter, okay? what is the nature of revelation, what is the nature of human self, human salvation. Okay? That is a higher degree of deen. Okay? And then higher than iman is ihsan. When a person in his inner self is connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay, he has that relationship okay, which human soul can have with divine being, and that is ihsan. Okay, that's the highest degree. Uh, therefore, at some point, you see in Quran that it makes difference between Islam and Iman and Ihsan. Okay. In Surah Hujrat, Quran says that these Arabs, Baddu, the tribal people who live distant from Medina, they, O oh Prophet, they come to you and they say, we have attained to faith. Okay. Al-Arabu Amanna. Qullam tu'minu, O Prophet, tell them that you did not believe. You do not have iman. Walakin <clears throat> qulu aslamna. But you should say that we are Muslim. We have submitted. We have submitted to the authority of Islam. وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Because Iman has not yet entered their hearts. Okay. Iman has not yet entered their hearts. Okay. So here <coughs> also we see the relationship of Iman with heart. Where it is supposed to rest. That is the place of Iman. Uh, and then <coughs> elsewhere, Quran says, "Inna al-lazin amanu wa amal al-salihat, wa al-lazin amanu summa taqaw, al-lazin amanu summa taqaw summa hsanu." Those who have iman have developed taqwa, have developed ihsan. Wallahu yuhib al-muhsinin, and God loves those who have ihsan. These three categories of human beings are mentioned in Quran in many places. Okay. We made air of this book, this revelation. Okay. Who will inherit this religion, this revelation, this scripture? Okay. The people whom we chose, that they are the heir of this religion, this scripture. The first category of women whom zalimul nafsihi. That the heir of this religion, the waris of this religion, okay, those who will inherit this religion. The first category is those who are sinful. Zalimul li nafsi means people who do wrong to themselves. And in Quran, zulmul nafs means committing acts of sin. That is the term which Quran uses. Because a sinful act hurts human self and its destiny. So, <clears throat> so zalimul li nafsihi, the people who hurt themselves, those who do wrong to themselves. And that is what most of us are. Okay. Okay. That, and, and, and Quran did count them as the heirs of revelation. Okay. That despite our wrong and our sinfulness, Quran accepted us as the heir of Prophet's revelation. That's one category. Okay. 
and then there will be people who will be righteous. Okay. They will pursue the higher path. Okay. Good people, virtuous people. وَمِنْ هُمْ سَابِقُمْ بِالْخَيْرَاتِ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ and then there will be those who will accede with the help of God in virtue. Okay? So you can see here Islam, Iman and Ihsan. Okay? That there are people who are at the degree of Islam, those who are at the degree of Iman and those who are at the degree of Ihsan. Okay. Now, <clears throat> When we look at the uh, history of Islam and I mean here religious and intellectual history, okay, not political history <clears throat> where we say who was the caliph, but religious and, polit and intellectual history of Islam. Islam developed into a full-fledged civilization which was rooted in the divine revelation. Foundations of that go back to Quran and Sunnah. And one of the <coughs> important aspect of that is the rise of Hulum, sciences, knowledges which developed in Islam. And these sciences were originally and essentially religious sciences. Okay. Because the first thing which was developed was Quran and its tafsir, okay. along with hadith and its methodologies. Okay. Then fiqh, law and usul al-fiqh. And, and many other. In contemporary Islam, we are jahil. Okay? We are absolutely jahil. We don't know what is Islam. We have forgotten it. The knowledge of Islam has died out. Very little. It's there. It cannot completely die, but it's very little. Because this Islam is the product of past 200 years, failure and defeat and humiliation and subjugation. Okay. Colonial Islam, then angry responses, you know, different expressions of anger. Not solid Islam, but expressions of anger. <clears throat> Therefore, if we want to understand Islam, we have to look at Islam's classical age. Okay? Now, not, I'm not saying that contemporary issues are not important because they are the context in which people have to live their religion, in which they have to decide the future. Okay? Uh, so, uh, we always come back to our time and age. So that's not that cannot be denied and rejected. But we cannot deny and reject what was there in terms of true and essential elements of Islam. Okay? So <clears throat> when the sciences and uloom developed in Islam, they were essentially in these three categories. Okay. In one hadith of Prophet ﷺ, in fact, Prophet defined Iman as iqrarum bil lisan wa tasdeequm bil qalb wa amalum bil jawareh. That faith is which is expressed through tongue and it's validated in heart and it is proven by the acts. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> all those uloom and sciences 
which deal with human activity, they become Sharia. The most important theme of Sharia, the scope of Sharia as a subject, what it studies, is that Sharia studies human activity and always focused on which activity is right, which activity is wrong. Sharia is not focused on inner aspect of faith. Okay. There is no sin which is not committed. Okay. In terms of Sharia, there is no sin which is not committed. Because Sharia in many ways works like, like any other law which requires a proof and evidence okay, and which develops out of clear resources. Okay. Where did you get this law? How you are applying it? Okay. And here Muslims develop law, principles of law, usul okay. al-fiqh, how do you develop these laws, what are the methodologies, okay. And in fact, in the uh, sciences of Islam, uloom which Islam developed, Sharia is in fact most prominent science, most prominent science. And enormous work in Islam is in the realm of Sharia. That many people think, Muslim as well as non-Muslim, Western observers of Islam, that they think Islam is very highly legalistic. There is too much law in Islam. Okay? They have this impression about Islam. But the reason that Sharia is high is because Sharia affects everyone. Okay. Everyone does not become alim, everyone does not become saint and wali, he is not on maqam ihsan. But everyone who is Muslim, Sharia is his need because he has to know what to do and what not to do. Okay. So since it concerns every human being, in his her daily life, daily activity, so Sharia became a very prominent and popular and well-known branches of Islam. Okay. Now, Now, in contemporary Islam, <clears throat> there is one big ignorance which is going on, okay, that is jihalat, pure jahal. <clears throat> Maybe I'll talk about it sometime in detail. And that is this idea that, brother, all we need is Quran and Sunnah, which is presented as a <coughs> kind of cheap slogan, okay? It's presented like a cheap slogan and gives an impression that as anything which developed in the history of Islam is somehow unnecessary or bid'a or a deviation. And that is a very, very stupid argument. Okay? Because Quran and Sunnah, <clears throat> Quran and Sunnah are simply the sources. They are the source documents from which 
everything else is derived. Quran is not Sharia. <clears throat> Quran is not Sharia. But Sharia is derived from Quran. Okay. And there is a methodology through which this Sharia is derived. The same is hadith is not sharia, but hadith is the source material from which sharia is derived. And if we do not have these mechanisms and methodologies through which sharia is derived, then Quran and hadith will become extremely confusing and impractical. Okay. Because one verse of Quran cannot be used as a law. Okay? It cannot be used as a law. Okay? Now we all know in Islam alcohol is haram, prohibited. Okay? There is no disagreement on that among any schools of thought. But there is a verse in the Quran which says do not drink when you go for prayer. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la taqrabu salata wa antum sukara Do not go near prayer when you are intoxicated, when you are drunk. Okay. Now if one, a person reads this verse and he says we can drink if there is no prayer time. Okay. Now that is right. If this verse is the basis of Sharia, then this opinion is right. Okay. But the problem is that that one verse cannot be the basis of Sharia. You look at many verses, many teachings, many hadiths, conduct of prophet, opinion of sahaba, and out of that you derive the law and Sharia. So in contemporary Islam, because of some ignorant development, there are people who try to run down all legal schools like Hanafi, Shafi, and Maliki and criticize all fiqh. And they say, brother, Quran and Sunnah is enough. No, it is not enough. Quran has 6,600 ayat. There are half million ahadith. Okay? How we are going to sort out where is what? Okay. We cannot. Okay, <clears throat> now here what we see in the history of Islam that these ulum and these methodologies they gradually develop. Okay. But they develop from the essential sources of Islam. If something has gradually developed, it does not mean that it is not original and, and authentic to Islam. You know, like some people will say, you know, there was no fiqh Hanfi at the time of Prophet. That is wrong. It was there. It was not called fiqh Hanfi, but it was there. Fiqh and Fi did not come from any other place except Quran and Hadith. Our Fiqh Shafi did not come from any other place except Quran and Hadith. Okay. So all these things were there, but they were not structured as such. Because in the world of knowledge, always ideas come first. Titles come second. A certain ulum develop and then a name and term is given to those sciences okay, when they are developing. Now, <clears throat> the, uh, so the idea of Sharia is there, part of Quran and Hadith always, though the sources and methodologies and techniques, they gradually developed. Okay? And they created mechanisms 
uh, through which uh, law can continuously be developed in Islam. Okay. Uh, so all these sciences which pertain to Islam as an activity, as an action, uh, they are part of Sharia. <clears throat> All those sciences which develop as a response to aqidah, iman. Okay. We believe in one God. What does it mean, one God? How we understand his oneness? How we understand his being? What is the nature of his relationship with created order? Okay. What does it mean he has 99 names? So these all issues pertain to aqidah. Okay. So that became ilmul aqidah or kalam. Now in modern times we don't talk about much. But historically we have many schools of thought. And they were divided on issues of aqidah. Okay, like Mu'tazila, Qadriya, Murjiya, Ash'ariya. These are schools of thought in Islam which defined aqidah and among them were some differences just like we have different legal schools okay. and the difference is not a problem difference is the richness of Islam okay. difference is the richness because enormous intellectual activity which creates variety of opinions. Okay. It's only a jahil society which is uniform. Okay. Because it cannot afford thinking. So they regiment everyone. Okay. But Islam was very rich and dynamic and it was not afraid of thinking. So there were many uh, intellectual school in various areas. The same in Ihsan, the ulum which developed in Ihsan, they became Tasawwuf, Ihsan, Tasawwuf, Vilaya. These were all ulum and sciences which developed pertaining to what is Ihsan and how it is achieved. Again, in modern times, many people criticize the sabbu, okay, and they think there is no sabbu in Islam. Now, that is nonsense, okay? <clears throat> because these people are looking at very corrupt expressions of the sabbu which exist in some Muslim land. You know, on the name of the sabbu and Sufi, there is a lot of fraud going on. So people resent that and reject it. Okay. So we are not using the term in that sense. We are using the term as it is originally used by the scholars who developed the sciences of Sufism. The earliest person who quoted, who used the word Sufism is Imam Malik and Imam Hassan al-Basri. These are the earliest people who talked about the Sufism. Okay? And both are Tabi'in meaning those who lived with Sahaba. Okay, and Imam Malik never left Medina and he is in the first great muhaddis. His kitab al-Muwatta is the first great book of hadith and he is the founder of Maliki school of law, fiqh Maliki in Islam. Okay. <coughs> Now, <clears throat> uh, the law or Sharia, and that's what I'm going to talk for the rest of my time. I, I want to cover this aspect, okay, Sharia. Okay, then other aspect, we, we will talk in future lectures. <clears throat> sure. Sure. Islam, Iman, and Ihsan. Yeah. Okay. 
Now, there is a uh, cassette of last month's lecture. There I talked about it in detail. So you can get that from Brother Ali Khan. Okay? He'll be back here. So it talks a little bit in detail, and I'll talk more about it. But Islam is equivalent to law. Iman is equivalent to faith. Ihsan is equivalent to spirituality. Okay? Three, basically. Okay. <clears throat> now, in terms of Sharia, now Sharia is the broader term for Islamic law. And sometimes, in fact, Sharia is used broader than law also, where Iman and Aqidah and Ihsan are also included in Sharia, in some texts. Okay. Uh, then there, is, there are some other terms like fiqh. Okay. Now fiqh means the process through which you derive law. It comes from Quran. فَلَوْلَا نَفَرَ مِن كُلِّ فِرْقَةٍ طَائِفَةٌ لِيَتَفَقَّهُ فِي الدِّينِ Quran says that why there should not be always a group of people who are indulged in deeper understanding of deen. Okay. So fiqh comes from their deeper understanding, fiqh. And that's why we call these, the person who indulges in fiqh is faqih. The plural is fuqaha. Okay. The jurists. And that's why we call Imam Abu Hanifa faqih and his legal opinions as fiqh. Fiqh Imam Abu Hanifa. Okay. Fiqh Imam Malik. That how Imam Abu Hanifa or Imam Malik understood or interpreted that law. Okay. Uh, so fiqh is another term. Okay. Another term which is commonly used is fatwa. People don't know what it is. Fatwa means a legal opinion. Okay, a legal opinion. Fatwa itself is not part of Sharia. But it becomes part of Sharia when fatwa is accepted by ulama. Okay? So for example, somebody asked me, uh, Brother Haq, what do you say about uh, uh, test tube babies in Islam. Okay. I'm in need of using this methodology to have children. Is it permissible? Okay. Now, of course, it's something new. It can't be in the Quran. So, if I am a scholar or faqih, I will look into Quran and Hadith if there is anything similar and if there is any material available. And on the basis of, I will develop an answer. Okay. And then on that answer is fatwa. Okay. So you will say, I asked Mr. Haq his fatwa, is it so okay? okay? Now you can go to another alim and faqih and he may say it's not okay. And we both are right. Because we both are trying to understand in the context of Quran and Hadith, but there is no sure way. Okay. So just like in Western law, in American law, there can be two different opinions. In Islamic law also, there can be two different opinions. Okay. Fatwa becomes binding only when it becomes part of ijma, consensus. Okay. So I give this fatwa, and then other ulama, they all study and they all approve it. Say, yes, this is the position of Islam. Okay. Then it becomes part of sharia. And it becomes binding upon the community. Okay. But of course, this aspect of Sharia, okay, there is a term in Quran for Islam for that. One is we call Nas. Okay, Noon, Saad, Saad, Nas. Okay. 
Nas is that law which is authentically present in Islam that cannot be changed. Okay? So like pork is haram in Islam. That's it. Now I cannot do any research and say I have investigated and really there is nothing wrong with it. Okay? I cannot come up with that opinion because it has been decided by God and his prophet in an absolutely clear manner. Okay. Now that law is not changeable. But this law which is based on ijtihad or thinking, it is changeable. It can be changed. Say so if tomorrow there are new situations okay, and new information and new knowledge, then these opinions can be changed. His opinion can be changed. Okay. For example, uh, in uh, Islamic law, just to give you an example, there is an issue that if a woman's husband disappears, how long she should wait before she is allowed to marry? And there are different opinions, one year, three year, four year, even 90 years different opinions. Okay. And in some of these opinions, the faqih and jurist is saying we have to wait three years to make sure she is not pregnant. Okay. Now in modern times, pregnancy can be determined right away. Okay. In those times, people really did not have exact knowledge that in what conditions pregnancy can take place. Okay. How long a male sperm can survive and can pregnant a woman. Okay. So they didn't know that. So they had different opinions from one year to three year to nine years. Now in modern society we know right away that whether there is pregnancy or not. Okay. So after we have this fact on our hand we can rethink the issue. We can say, okay, pregnancy is out of the question. That's not we are worried. So now let us see how much time she should wait. Okay. So this aspect of the law is something which is, can be interpreted or reconsidered if there is change in the situation. Okay. Another term which is used is qaza and qazi. Okay, that is also used in law because in Islam until the time of colonial age Sharia was the law of land in all Muslim societies and Qazi was like a chief justice, a judge. And in every society Supreme Court is an interpreter of law. When Supreme Court gives a decision in this country, it becomes a precedent for future decisions. An attorney goes to the court and he appeals on the ground of decision which Supreme Court has given in the past. Okay? So the same thing was in Islam that sometimes qada uh, was also the basis of discussing the law. Okay? So these are the terms which... Uh, pertain to law and they come in common language and sometimes people don't know the difference. Okay? Sometimes people think if there is fatwa it means it's like God's command. Okay? But Laden has issued a fatwa and now think people think it's like is it like something sharia? No. That is his opinion and he's not a scholar of Islam anyway. Okay? But he can give his opinion. Uh, <clears throat> now, as I said that Sharia, a law, it covers every aspect of Muslim's life. Every aspect of Muslim's life. Therefore, Fuqaha, jurists, they believed and they defined that there is no human activity, but it falls under 
some category of Sharia. This principle is called Al-Ahkamul Khamsa. The five categories of law or hukm, command. Okay. Al-Ahkamul Khamsa. Al-Ahkamul Khamsa means that Khamsa is five. That any human activity will fall in one of the five categories any human activity. There is nothing which will be outside these categories. Okay. Now, these five categories are nine and more in some legal schools, okay. especially in Imam Abu Hanifa, because they further classify each category. But broadly, there are five across the board. Okay. And these are Fard, Sunnah, Mubah, Makruh, and Haram. Okay. Fard means an obligation. Okay. An act is required, like five daily prayers. They are Fard. Fasting is Fard. Okay. Zakat or charity is The second act is which is strongly recommended, but it is not demanded, not required. Okay. So you came here to learn okay, this class, benefit from this course. Now that is strongly recommended, but don't, not required. Uh, 